The Pacific Ocean is our home. It is who we are. It is the source of life, the heart of our traditions and economies. It is home to marine life we depend on. As we speak, our source of life and our identity are threatened by deep sea mining. The damage it will cause could be irreversible, affecting millions of people in the Pacific. Imagine waking up one day to a lifeless ocean. What will become of us? Some of our own governments have joined with companies in a rush to mine the ocean floor. Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, Tonga, Nauru and Cook Islands have helped mining companies gain contracts to explore areas of seabed in their national and international waters. Many of their citizens are strongly opposed and want to stop this industry before it's too late. Deep sea mining in international waters is regulated by the International Seabed Authority or ISA, a body set up under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The ISA has issued 17 contracts for exploration of the deep sea floor of the Clarion Clipperton Zone, or CCZ, an area of the Pacific Ocean nearly the size of Europe, covering about 6 million square kilometers between Hawaii and Kiribati to Mexico. One third of the CCZ has been set aside for mining small rocks called polymetallic nodules. These sit on the sea floor three to six kilometers deep and contain metals such as cobalt, nickel, and manganese. The largest mining operation in world history is about to start in the backyard of Pacific Island states. The ISA has conflicting responsibilities to develop and regulate seabed mining and to protect the ocean from its impacts. But how can these roles be fulfilled by the one organization? For the deep sea life of the CCZ, nodules are breeding and feeding grounds and provide the only hard surfaces animals can attach to. Most of the species that live on and around nodules are found nowhere else on Earth. In its rush to develop mining, the ISA has given away nearly all of the nodule-rich area to exploration contracts. Many unique species and entire ecosystems may become extinct even before we know them. In 2012, after most of the exploration contracts had already been granted, the ISA declared nine protected areas called Areas of Particular Environmental Interest, or APEIs, where exploration and mining are not permitted. All of the nine APEIs were allocated around the edges of the exploration contracts, where nodule abundance is low. In 2021, the ISA established four additional APEIs only two smaller APEIs are located in the central nodule reach region. It is clear that the ISA's priority is the profit of the deep sea mining industry. What about the many of us who rely on a healthy ocean? Concern about the impacts of deep sea mining has led to widespread calls to halt its development. Marine science and policy experts, international fisheries bodies, global businesses, the IUCN, governments and civil society, 
including in the Pacific, have called for a moratorium or an outright ban. Tonga, Nauru and Kiribati have been persuaded by promises of great wealth to enter into exploration contracts with the Metals Company, or TMC, previously known as Deep Green. In June 2021, Nauru triggered an ISA rule that will allow Nauru Ocean Resources, NORI, 100% owned by TMC, to start mining in two years, even if the other 167 ISA member states have not yet agreed on regulations for mining. This is reckless. In documents filled with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, TMC admits that its mining operations could be just as destructive as land-based mining and could cause the extinction of entire species. TMC's publicity campaign, on the other hand, downplays the potentially serious impacts of deep-sea mining and the rich and unique life that is at risk. TMC hired the architect Spierke Ingels Group to produce visual designs which create a false picture that the deep-sea mining operations will be environmentally friendly with no impact or waste. Interpret, together with Deep Sea Mining Campaign and Oceanian Dialogue, conducted a visual investigation to counter TMC's greenwashing. We use the best publicly available science and environmental data to model the devastating and irreversible damage that deep seabed mining could bring to marine ecosystems and habitats. Contrary to what TMC says, the clarion Clipperton zone is not a vast underwater desert. To explore its rich biodiversity, we use a photographic survey of 88,000 images of seafloor habitat. The survey was carried out by an underwater drone in three seafloor landscapes most common throughout the region. Our image analysis of one track along which photographs were taken revealed about half of them recorded one or more deep sea animals. Here, we assume the distribution of these images containing species across a mining site. This survey not only covered just a tiny fraction of this vast region, but also came from an ISA protected area with low nodule abundance. Richer nodule areas such as nori could provide a habitat for millions of living organisms. TMC's mining operations could destroy a vast and little understood ecosystem. Nori D is one of Nauru's four contract areas. It is here that TMC plans to start mining by 2024, but has yet to provide any credible information on potential mining impact. We use publicly available engineering estimates to simulate for the first time TMC's mining footprint. We incorporate full-scale commercial nodule collectors, which will be much larger than industry prototypes, into our simulation. One day of mining is likely to destroy approximately two square kilometers of the seafloor. Over one month, approximately 40 square kilometers. And in one year, an area between 400 and 600 square kilometers will disappear. At a minimum, a single mining operation over a 30-year contract could impact an area of seabed similar to the land area of Hawaii.
If the results of an experiment by the research institute Geomar show that the disturbance tracks left by a small vehicle had not recovered after 37 years, then the damage from full-scale mining operations could be irreversible. Nodule collectors plowing through the soft sediment of the seabed will produce plumes that will spread far beyond the immediate mining site. The waste from the 24-7 processing of mined nodules on surface ships will create another plume around 1,000 meters or below. To better understand how these two plumes might spread, we use open drift a state-of-the-art platform for predicting how ocean currents transport particles and objects, such as oil drifts and microplastics. We track virtual sediment particles using ocean currents derived from a global ocean model. Together with a wide search of the scientific literature, this provides a well-grounded visual demonstration of the spread of plumes. Here, we model the seabed plume in the Nori D contract area using open drift. In just over 30 days, virtual sediment particles released 8 meters from the seafloor travel over 200 kilometers. Drifting far outside the Nori D block, the particles could impact seafloor life along the plume trajectory. Thousands of species, many still unknown to science, that evolve in a stable, unchanging environment over millennia could go extinct. Here, we model the mid-water discharge plume in the Tonga contract area. Virtual sediment particles were released just below 1,000 meters and allowed to sink and spread horizontally with different ocean currents. Along the way, the plume may harm free-swimming species, including whales, turtles, dolphins, sharks, and tuna, for example, by clogging their gills. Extending our simulation runtime, we predict that it will only take three months for the discharge plume to reach Hawaiian waters, a unique marine ecosystem, a source of livelihood and home for its custodians. The plume's potential toxic impacts are a critical unknown. Our visualizations vividly demonstrate, for the first time, the vast area of the Pacific expected to be impacted by deep sea mining. How will the many plumes from the rush to mine the ocean floor affect Pacific communities and all of us? Our oceans are already under so much stress, from climate change to overfishing and pollution. At this point, we really cannot consider any new activities that would add further stress to our ocean. Science is just starting to catch up with what oceanic people have always known. Our ocean is fluid with no boundaries. Everything is interconnected from our coral reefs to the deep sea. And these coastal communities who rely on our ocean as a source of life. Imagine waking up one day to a lifeless ocean. What would become of us? If companies get their way, deep sea mining is not a matter of if, but when. As oceanic people, we have a responsibility to our children and our children's children to preserve our kinship with the living ocean, which is so much a part of who we are. If we protect our ocean, we protect our home, our way of life, our identity and our future. Civil society in the Pacific and around the world are working to stop deep sea mining. We encourage you to find out more.